Hello again, everyone. Welcome to our daily devotion for Friday, August 2nd, 2024. Thank you so much for spending this time with me in God's Word today, as together we grow in our faith and in our knowledge of Jesus Christ as our Savior. Our psalm for today is Psalm 25. Psalm 25 of David. Lord, I appeal to you. My God, I trust in you. Do not let me be disgraced. Do not let my enemies gloat over me. No one who waits for you will be disgraced. Those who act treacherously without cause will be disgraced. Make your ways known to me, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me for you are the God of my salvation. I wait for you all day long. Remember, Lord, your compassion and your faithful love, for they have existed from antiquity. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my acts of rebellion. In keeping with your faithful love, remember me because of your goodness, Lord. The Lord is good and upright. Therefore, he shows sinners the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. All the Lord's ways show faithful love and truth to those who keep his covenant and decrees. Lord, for the sake of your name, forgive my iniquity, for it is immense. Who is this person who fears the Lord? He will show him the way he should choose. He will live a good life, and his descendants will inherit the land. The secret counsel of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he reveals his covenant to them. My eyes are always on the Lord, for he will pull my feet out of the net. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am alone and afflicted. The distresses of my heart increase. Bring me out of my sufferings. Consider my affliction and trouble and forgive all my sins. Consider my enemies. They are numerous and they hate me violently. Guard me and rescue me. Do not let me be disgraced, for I take refuge in you. May integrity and what is right watch over me, for I wait for you. God, redeem Israel from all its distresses. Jesse has sent David to the camp of the Israelite army to check on his brothers. And when David arrives, he hears Goliath's challenge and wonders why no one has stepped forward to accept that challenge. David then says, I will accept that challenge. And he demonstrates his confidence in the Lord. So David got up early in the morning left the flock with someone to keep it, loaded up, and set out as Jesse had charged him. He arrived at the perimeter of the camp as the army was marching out to its battle formation, shouting their battle cry. Israel and the Philistines lined up in battle formation facing each other. David left his supplies in the care of the quartermaster and ran to the battle line. When he arrived, he asked his brothers how they were. While he was speaking with them, suddenly the champion named Goliath, the Philistine from Gath, came forward from the Philistine battle line and shouted his usual words, which David heard. When all the Israelite men saw Goliath, they retreated from him, terrified. Previously, an Israelite man had declared, Do you see this man who keeps coming out? He comes to defy Israel. The king will make the man who kills him very rich and will give him his daughter. The king will also make the family of that man's father exempt from paying taxes in Israel. David spoke to the men who were standing with him. What will be done for the man who kills that Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Just who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? The troops told him about the offer, concluding, this is what will be done for the man who kills him. David's oldest brother Eliab listened as he spoke to the men, and he became angry with him. Why did you come down here, he asked. 
Why did you leave those few sheep? Who did you leave those few sheep with in the wilderness? I know your arrogance and your evil heart. You came down to see the battle. What have I done now? Protested David. It was just a question. Then he turned from those beside him to others in front of him and asked about the offer. The people gave him the same answer as before. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul. So he had David brought to him. David said to Saul, don't let anyone be discouraged by him. Your servant will go and fight this Philistine. But Saul replied, you can't go fight this Philistine. You're just a youth, and he's been a warrior since he was young. David answered Saul, your servant has been tending his father's sheep. Whenever a lion or a bear came and carried off a lamb from the flock, I went after it, struck it down, and rescued the lamb from its mouth. If it reared up against me, I would grab it by its fur, strike it down, and kill it. Your servant has killed lions and bears. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. Then David said, The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, Go, and may, be, may the Lord be with you. Then Saul had his own military clothes put on David. He put a bronze helmet on David's head and had him put on armor. David strapped his sword on over the military clothes and tried to walk, but he was not used to them. I can't walk in these, David said to Saul. I'm not used to them. So David took them off. Instead, he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the wadi and put them in the pouch in his shepherd's bag. Then with his sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. The Philistine came closer and closer to David with the shield bearer in front of him. When the Philistine looked and saw David, he despised him because he was just a youth, healthy and handsome. He said to David, am I a dog that you come against me with sticks? Then he cursed David by his gods. Come here, the Philistine called to David, and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with a sword, spear, and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord of armies, the God of the ranks of Israel. You have defied him. Today the Lord will hand you over to me. Today I'll strike you down. Remove your head and give the corpses of the Philistine camp to the birds of the sky and the wild creatures of the earth. Then all the world will know that Israel has a God, and this whole assembly will know that it is not by sword or by spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's. He will hand you over to us. Whenever a Christian in the first century brought up the resurrection of Jesus or the promise of the resurrection of the dead, the pagans had a really difficult time wrapping their minds around that concept. Pagans did not look forward to a resurrection of the dead. They wanted to be set free from their bodies, not uh, have their bodies back for all eternity, even if those bodies were going to be glorified. Paul has just mentioned the resurrection of Jesus in his defense of himself before Festus, Agrippa, and Bernice. And Festus is going to react to that, um, thinking that Paul has gone out of his mind. Paul is going to stick by his guns because he is telling the truth. And he is going to express his desire that Agrippa also would come to believe what Paul now believes. After this hearing before Festus, Agrippa, and Bernice, Paul is going to begin his long and eventful journey to Rome. As Paul was saying these things in his defense, Festus exclaimed in a loud voice, You're out of your mind, Paul. Too much studying is driving you mad. But Paul replied, I'm not out of my mind, most excellent Festus. On the contrary, I'm speaking words of truth and good judgment, for the king knows about these matters, and I can speak boldly to him. 
For I am convinced that none of these things has escaped his notice, since this was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you believe. Agrippa said to Paul, Are you going to persuade me to become a Christian so easily? I wish before God, replied Paul, that whether easily or with difficulty, not only you, but all who listen to me today might become as I am, except for these chains. The king, the governor, Bernice, and those sitting with them got up. And when they had, and when they had left, they talked with each other and said, This man is not doing anything to deserve death or imprisonment. Agrippa said to Festus, This man could have been released if he had not appealed to Caesar. When it was decided that we were to sail to Italy, they handed over Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion named Julius of the Imperial Regiment. When we had boarded a ship from Adramitium, we put to sea, intending to sail to ports along the coast of Asia. Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, was with us. The next day we put in at Sidon, and Julius treated Paul kindly and allowed him to go to his friends to receive their care. When we had put out to sea from there, we sailed along the northern coast of Cyprus because the winds were against us. After sailing through the open sea off Cilicia and Pamphylia, we reached Myra in Lycia. There the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing for Italy and put us on board. Sailing slowly for many days, we, with difficulty, we arrived off Tinnitus. Since the wind did not allow us to approach it, we sailed along the south side of Crete off Salmon. With still more difficulty, we sailed along the coast and came to a place called Fair Havens near the city of Lycia. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. Thank you so much for spending this time with me in God's word today. May the Lord richly bless your day. And I look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. Mm -hmm.